Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Mobile World Congress 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Okay, welcome back everyone. Live in Palo Alto here covering Mobile World Congress. This is the afternoon in California, evening in Barcelona, Spain, where Mobile World Congress 2017 is happening. And this is theCUBE's special coverage of Mobile World Congress where we bring our friends and experts and colleagues inside the studio to analyze the news and reach out to friends in Barcelona to get the scoops, get the news, opine, commentary, give reaction, and of course, color commentary, which we're not afraid of doing. And of course, our next guest is Lauren Cooney, who's an open source peer of, the, and she's currently retired, looking for her next opportunity. She's a guru, good friend, um, and we've met her in a variety of passes through the Docker Cons, the Linux Foundation, CNCF, uh, open source community, Lauren, great Brief to- Brief sabbatical. Brief, Brief sabbatical. sabbatical. to do some traveling, and you know, I won't bore you with Paris, or London, or Hawaii, or anything like that. I just like to say retire, because it sounds better, but- I know, know don't you know, we all wish. You're all rich and famous. <laughs> yeah, but you are internet famous. I mean, you have been very active in the open source community. I have, and, I have. And I wouldn't say internet famous, but I have been pretty active. <laughs> well, we're now on the Cube. You've been on the Cube multiple times. No, but all seriousness, this is a fun time of open source. You couldn't be uh, more pleased, at least from my standpoint. I love the action. Mm -hmm. If you look at what cloud native has turned into, to and where it's going and the, the forces around where Mobile World Congress is bringing the old telcos mm -hmm. into, in essence, an enterprise data center scale-like environment. Mm -hmm. You've seen the collision of what was once like large scale enterprise scale mm -hmm. with software yep. coming in with an old school telco trying to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is the future of the world, and that's exciting. And you know, you're in the middle of it. And so a lot of stuff that we're involved in is, center, is the center point of mm -hmm. innovation. So I think it's a great, great time to talk about that. First, I want to get your thoughts on Mobile World Congress. Uh, what are you hearing well, I'm, from I'm, your sources? <laughs> I'm hearing a couple things from my sources. So uh, FIDO, which is actually a project that's under the Linux Foundation, is going to be announcing some things this week. They are a software router that actually is operating uh, at, I believe, half a terabit right now, and they're going to be, I believe, improving that performance significantly um, and that will be announced, I think, at Mobile World Congress or potentially in the next week or so. So this is not yet hard news yet. So this, this is kind is of not a yet hard news, but I'm keeping my ear on the street, and that's what I'm hearing. And so. what's what's the impact? And let's talk about what this means and kind of in context to where it's been and the progress in that area. Well, if you start to look at the overarching umbrella that you're looking at from a networking perspective, things are all going to be faster. You know, there's 5G. Everyone's talking about how 5G is going to work what it's going to do, how it's going to enable IoT, um, you know, artificial intelligence, et cetera, things along those lines. What you really have to look at is, is how with the networking layer it's going to actually impact that. And you have to actually have the plumbing working so that you can mm -hmm. actually have the 5G working in the right way. So the plumbing has always been the problem. And, and again, the big buzzword and the theme coming out of uh, uh, Mobile World Congress is the same game, but now in a different arena, which mm -hmm. is network transformation. Mm -hmm. So what you're getting at is this, the network is still a bottleneck. So a lot of talk about NFV and a lot mm -hmm. of talk about SDN, kind of in mm -hmm. a new context. Your thoughts on what you're seeing around the, the positioning of how people are looking at NFV now, vis-a-vis -vis what is obviously on the horizon, which is kind of the glam, super demos, you're seeing all the, the sizzle, sizzle reel is autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. smart cities, uh, autonomous, uh, yep. smart home. Mm -hmm. Media entertainment over the top. Uh, Netflix was out there. Reed Hastings was was giving one of the keynotes. So mm -hmm. you know those are the four key areas. What I call the mental models of, of sex appeal for the tech. Yep. And and, the, and obviously VR and AR, which mm -hmm. reality is in there too. I put that in with autonomous vehicles, with drones and whatnot. I mean that's cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But yet, the operating model for that stuff is completely different. Totally different. Totally different. And what you have to look at is really how the network's going to enable that with virtualized functions and things along those lines. Um, when you start to look at how these telcos are actually going to deliver mm -hmm. on 5G, you have to look at how their networks are implemented and how they're actually implementing NFV and SDN. Most of them have already implemented SDN successfully. Mm -hmm. NFV is something new. People are looking at OpenStack. People are looking at you know, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. People are looking at Kubernetes. They're thinking, how are we going to actually have this work all together so that we can actually achieve this at talk, that higher talk about abstraction the, the layer? Lauren, talk about the sentiment in the developer community around uh, the Cloud Native uh, Compute uh, Foundation, which has evolved under the mm -hmm. Linux Foundation. And it really is a top of, I call, I won't say top of the stack, but much more of a glue layer around mm -hmm. orchestration, containers, microservices. Mm -hmm. These are beautiful um, 
paradigms for developers in a world where mm -hmm. you have need dynamic networking. Yeah, right? it's essentially, I mean, Kubernetes is essentially, you know, container management, right? So when you start to look at the impact that containers are having, you, you start to look at and where they're going, right? You're looking mm -hmm. at containerization of network functions. So you're not just looking at applications now, you're looking at network functions as well. And how's that going to happen? And I see Kubernetes moving down the stack. Effectively, you know, one of the things to look at is how Kubernetes and OpenStack are going to work effectively together going forward. Yeah, and I think that's going to be, you know, if the vendor, you know, arm wrestling and, and body slamming doesn't, you know, take toll on the industry, I think that could be a nice collaboration. And I wonder about the ecosystem. So the questions that I'm asking myself when I look at, you know, the, the world is, you know, who's going to be caught with their hand in the cookie jar trying to influence for their own vendor purposes, mm -hmm. their own uh, spiel? Because, you know, open source has been an honor system for many decades mm -hmm. and uh, generations. So I find it fascinating because I think the stakes are very, very high right now uh, in the work that the Linux Foundation is doing in some of these areas where mm -hmm. open source has been the key Yep. To most of the innovations, we're going to have our next guest coming on. He's one of the early um, engineers at Yahoo. I think it was like the fourth or fifth employee built that up at large scale. I think it built on open source. I mean, everything now has been pure open source. So, again, not much of this is being talked about mm -hmm. at uh, at uh, Mobile World Congress. Yet, words like software defined radio, <laughs> software defined networks, mm -hmm. <laughs> software defined <laughs> blank. I mean, it's becoming software defined. Mm -hmm. So, I'm kind of thinking, what's your thoughts on? You know the role of the developer community as uh, the, de the hardcore developers, whether they're you know the full stack hardcore developers mm -hmm. or more artisan composable developers. I mean, I don't mean the over general. Well, you have to look at kind of the the layers of developers, right? There are fewer layers at the networking, or there are fewer developers at the networking stack layer. It's just more complex. There's just not a lot of programming that you can do. You move up the stack, you get to Kubernetes, you get to Cloud Foundry, you get to things like that, and there's people that are building really cool things. I think that what we're going to have to be looking at is the communities out there that have the most developers today, and those are already well-established companies. You've got Microsoft, yeah. you've got AWS, you've got Salesforce, you have um, you know, OpenStack to a certain extent. You've got a lot of folks that are you know, cooking lots of developers in there. Well, and you also have building. people like Oracle and Cisco mm -hmm. trying to boot their developer program. Mm -hmm. Cisco's got a great developer program, I got to say. Their Susie's. DevNet has been mm -hmm. really impressive. But when you look at DevNet though, it is, although I would agree it's impressive mm -hmm. what they've done, um, it's still Cisco. Right, so mm -hmm. I know DevNet Create's coming out in May, yep. um, and that looks really promising mm -hmm. uh, to go outside of the classic Cisco world, but this brings up, not almost, I hate to say the word retraining, but mm -hmm. you're seeing people who want to be a little bit more horizontal mm -hmm. uh, in, in their skill set because of the cloud native yep. opportunity. So I want to ask you how are, because this is the same problem the telcos face, mm -hmm. these classic developers, what is the, the key to success uh, in these communities, we get these these developers that know really hardcore, say Cisco, for example, mm -hmm. hardcore networking. Yep. I mean, those guys just are a different breed than mm -hmm. some you know DevOps guy. I mean, they're doing like, some parallel similarities, but for the most part, they're different. The guys are doing network stuff, right? Well, even with serverless, you're going to need operations, folks. I mean, let's let's get real, right? Like serverless is just an easier way to deploy applications and things along those lines. Um, but I think that one of the things that people are need to be looking at is what is the skill set up the stack? Because if you look up the stack, what you're seeing is actually more of those things that, like Kubernetes and containers and microservices and things like that, trickling down to that networking layer. So those technologies and those, yeah. those capabilities are going to be needed at that networking layer. And so folks need to actually learn those skills that all, all developers are learning today. Yeah. And to be able to apply them at the networking layer is going to give them a competitive advantage. Serverless, really, let's, go, let's unpack that. What is, what you, define serverless for the folks out there, and let's, <laughs> let's def, and generally speaking. Serverless is a marketing term. It's a marketing <laughs> term for essentially cloud-native-like stuff. So, I mean, that's really what we're talking about. Um, what so is the, what does it mean? What is it Basically impact? you have, so you have microservices, right? And I, I tweeted yeah. this earlier, right? Because Ruv was on here the, just yesterday, yeah. right? And he was unpacking it, so I won't rehash what he said. What I will say is you're, you know, you're kind of taking components of different sorts of applications and you're putting functions yeah. in different areas for microservices. Yeah. And when you're looking at serverless, you can take microservices and you can deploy them across a serverless environment, which is actually a bunch of servers that are managed by someone, essentially, so that you, it's automated and the developers don't have to do the work when it comes down to deploying the applications. 
getting a lot of tweets coming in. Oh, I can hear my direct messages going off. I hear servers. Yeah. Well, what about fog computing? I know it's completely different. <laughs> of course, invented in the Bay Area with all the fog. No, but this is all buzzwords. I mean, with buzzword bingo is at an all-time high at Mobile World Congress. But the, I think the serverless thing, although it's trendy, mm -hmm. is very relevant because it I speaks so. to cultural shift on development philosophy, which is, hey, a bunch of servers can be shared, whether mm -hmm. it's virtual servers or physical servers. And it really focuses the emphasis on um, different kind of abstractions, mm -hmm. declarative uh, uh, versus specific mm -hmm. uh, configurations. How, how, do we, how does that advance? So I guess the question is, in your view, what's, what's the scuttlebutt in the community around what is needed to accelerate the, the movement towards um, cloud native evolution. What, what, what's some of the things that you see being talked about in the in the community around? How do we accelerate the movement? Well, I think it's I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, I think it's going to be um, like let's take it a step back almost, and let's take a look at open source and where open source is going, and then let's take a look at AWS. And I think it's um, you know they've got an IoT platform that is in I think limited trial right now. And um, are they at Mobile World Congress? No, either Samsung isn't, Apple isn't, I mean. But it's interesting yeah. because they've got a lot of developers, right? So it's going to become a, a war of AWS versus open source, I almost yeah. think, when you start yeah. to look at this. And you've got to kind of hedge your bets and look at the technologies and figure out which one you're going to that's use. A great, that's a great observation. In fact, I was thinking that same thing and I kind of tweeted and mentioned on theCUBE after KubeCon up in Seattle this past year where you know, it was pretty obvious besides the devastating, devastating loss of, uh, of, of the election, but the point was is that I saw a direct collision course between open source developer community and Amazon because there was some hallway conversations around mm -hmm. people saying, hey, you know what? I'm afraid to invest in that project because what if Amazon just makes it native in mm -hmm. the stack? Yep. That essentially decimates a mm -hmm. potentially a community. So I think Amazon's certainly aware of this, although they will act like they're not, but I think they mm -hmm. are aware of this interesting dynamic. Now the telcos could benefit from this. Mm -hmm. So don't you think that, you know, <laughs> my enemy's friend is my enemy, whatever that expression goes. I mean, the telcos can say to the open source people, hey, let's do this. Well, I think Amazon's going to be smart and make some good partnerships as well, right? Because they, you know, you've got off-prem, you've got on-prem, right? And you've yeah. got to kind of figure out how to do that hybrid environment for the cloud and what developers want and what telco providers want and things along those lines. There's not just, yeah, no one's going to take all their stuff yeah. and, push it into the public cloud. I think it's a wake up call for the developer community. I mean, I think, you know, being a developer of early days with open source was interesting because like, if, I think the developers can be a little bit arrogant. I don't mean there's a negative thing, but I mean, Amazon is not as Machiavellian as people think, give them credit mm -hmm. for. They're very customer centric and they'll do what the, they'll weigh on the air on the side of the customer. They're excellent. They're so excellent from a developer focused perspective they, and a customer focused perspective. They're very customer focused, but that being said, I think the developer community can mm -hmm. be customer focused too as well. So mm -hmm. the question is, you know, there's a there's a trade-off and this tension between mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur, I would be nervous about starting a company where Amazon could literally put me out of business. This is the same mm -hmm. rationale that we when I was growing up in the business, uh, Microsoft was the big uh, mm -hmm. enemy. Well, they, they can just put you out of business with a feature. Yeah. So there's always that entrepreneurial balance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be very interesting. But again, cloud native seems to be the key. All right, any other news uh, for us from uh, Mobile World Congress? You no, know, I think I kicked it off with some of the news. I think that it's interesting, you know, Cisco's doing some things with Jasper and things yeah. along those lines, and they've increased the number of devices that are connected to that management platform pretty significantly. I think that's interesting. Um, also, you know, Cisco also partnered and did some work with 5G and Verizon. Mm -hmm. And when is 5G really going to come out? I know you guys yeah. have been talking about that. Yeah, it's a mixed reaction on that. It's I mean, Intel reaction. says Olympics uh, in 2018. Mm -hmm. Most probably would be a trial network. They already have some trials, but I think the general consensus is, you know, there's a lot of FUD now being uh, put into the into the mm -hmm. into the network because Intel's put a big stand. Mm -hmm. I mean, Intel's going big on this thing. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, the question comes up: Is do I want more bandwidth or more mobility or more battery life? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I just reviewed a bunch of sessions for the Open Networking Summit. So I was on the group in the group that actually picked the sessions for what's going to be at the Open Networking Summit, and 5G is going to be covered. Yeah. There's a lot of different things there that are going to be covered around this area. SDN is going to be covered in an advanced way, so new and you know. Well, how take, to, a, take a minute to uh, do a mm. preview of the uh, ONS Summit, Open Networking sure. Summit, because Scott Rainovich will be co-hosting the Cube uh, with mm -hmm. Stu Miniman. So I'm not going to be able to make it this year. Um, what's the preview of the ONS Summit? Give it a little commercial. What's the next generation architecture for networking, and what's that going to look like, and how does 5G play into that, and how do things like IoT play into that? a lot of things from Mobile World Congress, but more at the networking level. Yeah. You're going to see how open source is actually driving this and actually how, um, 
you know, one of the things that I focused on when I was going through all the sessions was I want real world use cases. I want things that are in deployment. I don't want things that are in test. Right, so what's working, what's not. I don't want the BS, I want the real stuff. And it's a real technical show, it's mm -hmm. not, and what's the profile? It's a, the... There's a business track and there's a technical track. So there's actually two tracks this okay. year, so it'll be actually great for both business and technical people to attend and, and kind of understand what's going on. If you could just on. summarize the, the problem statement or current status of that industry and that communities, those communities, what's the big focus area right now? Where's that uh, emphasis right now? Interoperability. And drop ability. Yep. Yeah. And, the, and the business impact, what's the, the business impact side? I would say from the business impact side, it's how do we make more money? Yeah, so the, the network still becomes ARPU that. ARPU is gonna be critical. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. Well, Lauren, thanks for coming on Thank theCUBE. Really much. appreciate it, Lauren Cooney, open source guru. Um, on a sabbatical, trying to, she's not sharing what she's gonna do next, but she's, no. <laughs> she's got a spring in her step. I can tell she's got something cooking. Uh, certainly we uh, will see at the Linux events and uh, the Open Networking Summit with theCUBE will be there. Of course, more Mobile World Congress coverage and analysis with more guests here in Palo Alto after this short break.